I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to another Real Conversation with one of my favorites, the one and only Daniel DiMartino Booth. Welcome for our upteenth Zoom, or whatever we're going to call this, Danielle. We're getting too old to keep count, Keith. Let's just not. <laughs> well, uh, I am. You, you, you're, you're a younger, younger woman and, and looking better by the day, I might add. Thank you for all, all your contributions, stirring up uh, the bees nest that is Twitter again today. We'll get into some of those topics. But um, you know, first, just waterfront. I, I know everyone wants to know what you think of the new, uh, the new combo, uh, j Powell and Janet Yellen. I mean, what is not to like? Mentor, mentee. <laughs> I mean, learned at the hip. Originally, he was the rebellious teenager talking about, you know, being short volatility and quantitative easing being, you know, addictive. And But he learned. He finally learned. He was whipped into shape. And in the end, he was not just cast uh, as Greenspan, who spawned Bernanke, who spawned Yellen, who spawned Satan. I mean, who spawned Powell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, he actually learned from his predecessors and was able to even one up them. So, I mean, he made Draghi blush with the shock and awe and he got to buy junk bonds before anybody else in the world. So I would say that he is he's learned very well and that this should be quite the dynamic duo. How does this um, come to be? You know, I, I you know the back and forth. You and I have a lot of conversations with investors behind the scenes and whatnot. Like, how did she? We know where she came from, but how did she come to be head of the treasury, and why was it so important at this particular time? Well, we know from from public records that she became very embedded in the Wall Street community in her post Fed life, raking in ungodly amounts of money at the podium which is what they all do. It's not as if she broke the mold, uh, <laughs> but maybe she became a more familiar person because when she used to be up in front of a Congress during her semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins, they used to call it semi-annual con congressional testimony and somebody would ask her about regulation or the financial markets, you know, her eyeballs would kind of roll into the back of her head because she was a <laughs> Berkeley trained labor economist who had no interest in those things. But, you know, maybe in her post-Fed life, she became a little bit more well-spoken in financial markets and, and she understands the plumbing a little bit better and we know she can cross the aisle. So what's, you know, what's not to like? I mean, there there is a huge risk that Wall Street's taking, but, uh, but I don't think that that's where their mind is right now. Their mind is very much in the very, very immediate, immediate term about what she can accomplish in terms of making sure that that Michael Bloomberg doesn't come out and say, no supersizing this, no, no, but we're going to supersize the stimulus. And I think that that's what the hope is. So, of course, she was put in that seat by Wall Street. I think that's what you just said, or at least part of what you just said. I, I, I didn't say that, Keith. I said that <laughs> I said that she needs to become much more familiar with people in Wall Street by because when they write big checks, you better be familiar. Well, if you are more politically correct than I for the next uh, 45 minutes, this is going to be fun. Uh, the, the, the reality is, though, you have, a, and you made that point, a labor economist who, if you didn't know she was political, obviously when she was head of the Fed, obviously she, she's made that quite obvious at this point. But you, it's not just her who's a labor economist. You have CeCe Rouse uh, at the CEA, who's also the labor economist. So when I watch it all together, to me, it looks like we're trying to get to a place of empathy for all the things we have to do uh, for people that need a job. The way that she talks about it is quite interesting. It's, it's obviously scripted. She very rarely goes off script. She does not go off script, uh, and you know, uh, unlike some of her predecessors who are a little bit more sober, more mature about the idea of income inequality, she remains bitter. Mm. So she, if, if there's one thing she's realized, don't get me wrong. I mean, her nest egg is set, and that of her, you know, generations to come after her. But if if there's one thing she understands now that she's been full on in front of Wall Street and in the audience with these people is that. The transmission mechanism to Wall Street is definitely not broken when it comes to the Fed, but it is broken when it comes to Main Street. Right. So if there's one thing that COVID has taught us, it is that the Fed has outright failed on its second mandate to maximize employment. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. So but again, I mentioned a risk earlier, and that is that she actually accomplishes getting money directly into the hands of people. And that would not be Wall Street friendly at all. Yeah, I want to get into that uh, big time because this is good. this is going to be big time if if it is executed in all of its manifestations or possibilities of which are manifest. But you know, if you look at her today and that comment about being bitter about it, 
I mean, Bernanke just blatantly ignored it, right? He'd never talk about the dollar or the transmission mechanism of inflation and real world costs when the dollar's being burnt to a 40-year low. Uh, Powell just kind of whimsically never really had to address it. And when, when he does, he's all over the place. Um, but her, she's bitter. Now, what, what, and, and that really is the context of how she took the job. First thing she, she did when she gave her mini speech was talking about how, how her father, she watched her father in Brooklyn, I believe, and how the decency of a job was the most important thing. And that's what she always wanted to do was uh, be on the front lines of that as a labor economist. What does it all mean, the bitterness and, and, and the, the mission, really? Well, we don't know. Uh, because we, we've not seen anything like this since 1977 when the economic backdrop was dramatic enough to, to reopen the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what the possibilities are. Wall Street is hoping that she stops with, under the right circumstances, the Fed should buy stocks. That's where Wall Street is hoping the potential <laughs> changing of the law, massaging of the law ends. But it, it, to, to me, at least, and you know, my, my buddy David Rosenberg completely disagrees with me on this. You know, she, he, he's like, she's the one that started the tightening cycle. I'm like, six and a half years after the recession was over. Okay, so she, the slowest tightening cycle in the history of the Fed, but still she did pull the first trigger post GFC. But, but what if the thing is actually opened such that she can fulfill her lifetime dream of getting money to hardworking Americans in her mind? And that requires the Fed to be able to step up to auction and directly monetize the debt. That is that is not friendly. That is what Lacey Hunt's line in the sand is. Once you cross it, once you get to direct legal monetization of the debt, then you open the hornet's nest that's been closed for 40 years of inflation. I mean, that uh, and, and that's in motion. I mean, um I'm sure you're familiar with my quad speak, but currently what we say we're in quad two, where you have both growth and inflation accelerating at the same time. Um, the, you know, the, the dog has been chasing the fire truck and he's going to catch it is the way we look at it. So we're going to get, if we're right, we're going to have north of a 3% headline inflation rate before we get even to the summertime. So, you know, we have this that they're going to have to deal with. This is a question that I go back and forth with a lot of institutional investors and I say, just envision, go to Boston. Let's just start in Boston. Let's go to the Boston Fed, grab the top whatever five economists you can grab out of the lunchroom, grab top economists at Wellington, Fidelity, et cetera, and, 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 and have a discussion, an open discussion after the headline unemployment or headline inflation rate has a three in front of it. What does that look like? How does Janet react? How does Powell react? Do they have different reactions because they have different things they ostensibly might want to accomplish for different constituencies? Well, you know, so look, there, there are several factors at hand right now. And we have to remember that when Janet was at the podium, her favorite word was transitory. Yeah. So we have these <laughs> massive base effects. It's just pure math that we're going to see higher core CPI prints. We're going to see higher core PCE prints. But the Fed and the Treasury are likely to look through these as being transitory. And right now, by the way, the 15 basis point move off of 119 in the 10 year to 104 is kind of sort of telling you that inflationary pressures are building but dot 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 down the pipeline where's the where, where's where's the pricing power so there are still a lot of tensions in terms of the ability to translate the inflation beyond a margin squeeze for corporations and that is a great unknown i i, I don't have the answer to that question right now yep. so Especially, especially because China's starting to shut down and nobody, you know, I, I think at last talk, the whisper is that 46 ports of entry for human beings in and out of China are closed. I mean, people are not paying attention to Lunar New Year cancellation 2.0. But so for all of the supply chain disruptions, and that is at the root cause of the inflation, not, not some economy that is growing organically, but growing because of the stimulus spending, but for all of the supply chain disruption that has created the inflationary tensions that we've seen, that could get worse here in the short term on top of mathematical base effects to your 3% point. But how would the Fed react? Well, they do like that word transitory. Yeah, transitory is going to be what it's going to be, but it's not. it doesn't mean anything to me in terms of making money, like like I care. I mean, it's at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is front run their behavior. Always you know, tried to teach people to do that. People say, don't fight the Fed. I'm like, of course not. Front run the Fed. I mean, if I you can... I don't react to the, to the print that you're talking about. I, I, I don't think they're going to... They've been broadcasting 
that they want to let inflation run hot, that they want to average it out over the you know past whatever four decades they've been missing their inflation mandate. So I, I don't think that you're going to see. I think that if there's one thing that we saw in Jay Powell's most recent public appearance, and we'll be looking at the podium tomorrow at 2.30 Eastern Standard, is fear in his eyes. <laughs> the, the Czech National Bank, they were pretty articulate overnight. They are ready to talk normalization. The Bank of Canada, not too far behind. And the Fed would certainly follow, even though Lagarde is, as my favorite FX guru said, you know, the ECBs over at, at, at the ice cream truck, you know, trying to decide what flavor they're going to have. So they're they're truly not thinking about thinking about having that conversation because Italy, I think, is in the in the process of its 117th government being formed, et cetera. So you don't want to that that apple cart is really hard to upset because people don't realize how tenuous the euro situation is right now. You know, what's interesting about that, like when you flush it through to bond yields, at least on my signal, is that we do, we, first of all, bond yields have bottomed globally because inflation or deflation bottomed cyclically and globally. So that, to me, is a big thing. And it could be a bigger thing in a shorter window of time than a lot of people that are thinking about it on a linear basis want to admit. So, guys, show slide uh, 15. So just so that we have this on the page, like in terms of where we're at on inflation. Yeah, it's one thing, Danielle, for them to like say, okay, yeah, we're looking for two. I'd say that that's what's priced in at 1.10 or 1.15 on the 10-year yield. I don't think 3.13 is priced in. Um, that's my opinion. That's what I'm setting up for. I, and again, I'm trying to proactively predict what that kind of behavior, I think it's going to look, to me, I think it's going to look a lot like excuse making uh, at a bare minimum for, from Powell's perspective and why he's not doing this that other central banks are doing, to your point. Um, but then Janet goes, but look over here, the jobs. Like that to me is like, you don't even have to say transitory anymore. You just say, I don't care. That's inflation, but it's these jobs I'm trying to create. At the same time, cost of living is going to be ripping people's eyelids up. Like, this is going to be a real thing in terms of year over year. That, that's what those numbers impute. I mean, that, that, I don't know if you can be the empathist of the world with her on jobs and the people and say, hey, look, you know, food prices just doubled. She won't stand for it. And what's more interesting is that my buddy over at Bank of America, Michelle Meyer, she runs a great economics team. Their, their live real-time credit debit data showed that the $600 stimulus payments for the people who need it the most were spent in 10 days. So wow. you really have That's to what... follow the bulk <laughs> of it was spent in 10 days. Yeah. So you really have to follow how aggressive the Yellen Treasury is going to be about getting money to the people. You know, the, the, the unity inside the Beltway lasted for about 48 hours. And, you know, a, a bunch of executive orders later, there's a lot of acrimony that is remaining. And it kind of feels like we, where we were in November. And you've got Chuck Schumer out there saying, well, you know, for sure we'll have something done by mid-March. Well, no shit, Chuck. That's when the unemployment insurance benefits run out. <laughs> you better have something done by then. So because you've got whatever, 15 million people still collecting these benefits, you better figure that out by mid-March. But this is no longer a first two, two and a half weeks. Remember, Schumer's first statement was there's going to be that, that $1,400 extra check is going to be in the hands of people by the end of January. That's not happening. So but if Yellen starts to get really upset about this scarring, it's her favorite word now, scarring in the economy. That's going to translate into figuring out how to get money to people. Yeah, I mean, that, that to me, when I watch her, this is not obviously the same person that was head of the Federal Reserve in terms of political narrative. Uh, it's like why, if Karl Marx had somebody by his side speaking for the people empathetically, Amity Schley's style, however you want to explain it, during the Depression, you would have her. And you would have her you know, use these types of words, decency of jobs, scarring of of humanity. It's, it's, and, and, and to me, that's why Wall Street put her in that chair, because it has to be an apologetic combining of the Fed and the Treasury and doing whatever hasn't been allowed before. They have to, they have to go there, don't they? Well, you have to remember her predecessor, you know, made a ton of money off the subprime crisis. So, yes, it, it's very possible that they see, you know, that they see the need to put a kinder, gentler, very soft spoken. You know, she probably needs, you know, the little Rick Santelli milk crate at the podium. You know, <laughs> so I get that. I get that. I yeah. get that. I get that. But but by the same token, 
there's a lot of regulation coming down the pipeline. And I'm, you know, again, we're talking about, this is a woman who has said that, you know, it's time to reopen Dodd-Frank. And she's bringing somebody in to be her right-hand lieutenant who is of the same exact opinion. And Gary Gensler is gonna figure out what a, you know, what a chat room and cool talk and all these laws that are being broken a little bit late, but he's gonna come in with guns loaded trying to figure out yesterday's problems. So these are not Wall Street friendly things. And neither are Janet being absolutely determined to get as much money into the hands of people as possible, even if you have to take a shotgun approach that creates inflation. Now, um, let's get into that next. Just one more question on this before we get off the people part. Um, you know, some people like Stephanie Kelton, slide uh, 94 guys, you know, don't even really say anything anymore other than using emojis and, you know, state and local. In this case is what happened. Of course, she tweeted, I'm sure you noticed that, but she tweeted that um, right after it became obvious that we were not going to, we're going to, we're going to have, um, you know, the, the blue wave. Um, so, so where does she fit on that? I get a lot of questions on this. Like, how does this all look? Actually, a lot of questions have to do, Danielle, not, uh, not surprisingly, what happens when Powell's gone? And it might be Lyle Brainerd with uh, CeCe Rouse and you know, Yellen and Kelton. Like, that's, first of all, that's four women out of four. Um, that's completely different. Um, and it's, there's a lot of possibilities here in terms of the tone what that is relative to what Wall Street would have liked or, 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 or is expecting, I don't know. But, but Keith, I, I think what you're missing is that there's a gap to bridge in between such a development in February of 2022. I mean, the, the hardest, it, the, the Fed will change its narrative the minute the markets force it, that. They'll back down on all this inflation narrative. They'll back down on everything if the market's correct. We're talking about 10, 15 percent. Yep. They've never not changed their narrative. Mm -hmm. You could easily have a Federal Reserve and a Treasury in conflict with one another if Wall Street gets hurt. And again, it's look, I know Grant, I know Jeremy Grantham is considered to be a perma bear, but if but he's right that when bubblish behavior becomes as in your face and arrogant as it is today. You're a matter of months, not years away from whatever the culmination is going to look like. And if that's the case, then Jay Powell will come to the rescue of Wall Street yep. however he can. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that at all in terms of the timing. In fact, if you look at like what we're saying on quad projections, I mean, the party ends at the end of the second quarter. And when the party ends, you hit slide 20, guys, quad four. Quad four is when the disinflation or the deflation comes back, of course. That's when the rate of change of growth and inflation starts to slow again. And that's absolutely 100 percent of the time when the Fed comes in to the rescue. But you know, to your point, they come in after the shit's hitting the fan in the market. And that's really the problem here. Like, I'm concerned. I'm set up for it. I'm not just concerned. Full disclosure, I think the 10-year yield is going to go to 1819. I'd completely disagree with Gunlack, um, as I have for a while now. And directionally, you know, I, li I like my model relative to his. So um, what, if, what if that all happens? In three months, three, literally we're on the screws within three, four months, we're going to see these inflation prints. The market's going to have to deal with it. You have bubbles everywhere. And bubbles, by the way, if they weren't, I wouldn't be long them. I think that's another problem people have with their own baggage. You know, they just, if you, if you knew it was a bubble, why wouldn't you be long it? You know, well, well, because we're just sophisticated calling it bubbles. You know, I wouldn't touch such a thing. Now, that's not the way to deal with it, actually. If you've seen bubbles before, you'd like to own them on the way up because you make more money. Uh, so again, I do think that all that's coming to a head here in the next three to, three to four months. It doesn't matter what you throw at this market, it's a melt-up. It yeah. just doesn't matter. You can, you can ask any scientist in the world right now, given the shit show in South Africa, the UK, and Manus in Brazil, all those three variants are here, but it, it yeah. doesn't matter. No. News lines don't matter. Data don't matter. Economic data do not matter. We've had a $1.4 million initial jobless claim print two weeks in a row. It doesn't matter. Not when you're melting up. No, not when you're going to get quad two. Like we have an 11% GDP number for Q2 year over year. Guys, uh, you can show what that looks like, and a, th and a north of 3% inflation number. Those numbers, if we're right, have never been reported together, uh, unless you've been run you were running money shortly after World War II. You've never seen numbers like that. I mean, that's, that's what the market's discounting, I think. And, and I mean, if I'm wrong on that, and I've certainly not been wrong on the market call, but I mean, the reality is that that number is standing out you know, in a way that it never has before. So 
you know, what do you think about that? Like, I mean, at the end of the day, is the market actually discounting that Q2 is going to be as hot as a firecracker or not? It, it certainly appears to be, Keith. And again, this is not, you, you do not need a quantum computer to figure this out. This is pretty simple base effect math stuff that you're doing right here. Really, it is. And, but you are looking beyond June right now to the market saying, all right, I've, I've got it. What's next? Yeah, yeah. But until then, again, the narrative absolutely does not matter because the math is bigger and it looks like there's going to be more money put into the hands of individuals. So once we get to the next part of the movie, let's just say for, you know, for argument's sake that this is what happens. I tend to go with that every morning. Uh, but let's say that we get back into quad four in the summertime. Like how do mechanically, and, and you've written about this in like only you can, whether it be the, the latest introduction from Pat Toomey on what the Fed can or cannot do or, or what Janet would love to do with Jerome. Like, can you talk about like what they, they're going to do when the shit hits the fan? Look, I went into this year saying that in 2021, the Fed was going to need a black swan. The Fed needed a black swan in February of 2020, badly. They're not QE, was really fraying at the edges. There was counterparty risk that was bubbling up to the surface. There was a very, there was a deep lack of trust on the credit side. The collateral was being questioned. Somebody needed to come in with something big. Yeah. And But in order to do that, because he couldn't say it was anything beyond a plumbing issue, he needed a black swan event and he got one. Pat Toomey, to raise the, 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 the most important name of December 2020 that you can bring up has made sure that you cannot just flip the switch back on. Hmm. Can, you go, can you go through the mecha uh, mechanics of that? I'm, I'm sure people care about the plumbing. So look, what Pat Toomey said was, you have to come up with a new 13-3 emergency. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to say, okay, the shit hit the fan. We're just going to flip all these credit facilities back on. He's saying, no, you can't do that. You have to construct something new and you have to have a new reason to revisit 13.3. And you're gonna have to present your case. So I'm a little mystified that the media is writing as, 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 as lazily as the media is right now that Yellen's now in office and she can just flip the switches back on. Mm. The legislation says that that is not possible, that identical constructs are not possible, that the, 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 the contract with black office does not, not, no longer applies. Mm -hmm. So, again, can, look, can bureaucrats and politicians and central bankers come up with a new emergency? Hell, yes, they can. But what if they don't have the new emergency itself? What if they right. don't have the black swan? What if it's just more scarring, more of the same? And that's why you have so many people saying that, that, that central bankers, the confidence bubble in central banking is going to burst if they just go on month after. People don't realize the Fed hadn't done shit since March. People don't <laughs> realize that they haven't done a damn thing. But at some point, they're going to demand some new action on the part of the Fed, or they're going to call bullshit. Keith, and it's going to be that simple. Yep. I mean, and, and, so let's just kind of go through that. Because we got to where we're at, where we could be going, and what the logical and only response is by the Fed. But you're saying, hey, handcuffs are on here. You can't do the same thing. And by the way, even if they weren't on, I think what you also said was the complexion of what they're going to do, uh, given Janet's input, is going to be different anyway. It's not going to be for Wall Street. It's going to be for the people. That's right. And if there is an emergency that is forced and you have to go back to these discussion tables again, Janet might say, look, my friend Christine over there, they're, they're designing a central bank digital currency and all these countries are figuring out how to get the money directly to the people. And we can do that, too. Mm. We can't. We will screw Wall Street to the wall because we'll... <laughs> It won't be like the kind of inflation that you talk about being kind. And oh, and by the way, there's all this commercial real estate and all of this massive wall of investment grade, investment grade debt that has to be refinanced, right? High yields, the only, only major asset class that does not have a 2021 refinancing wall. But you're going to introduce a market setting mechanism to interest rates in the middle of this? Yeah, for the people, mind you. <laughs> Screwing Wall Street to the wall. That's, that's uh, I'm not, I, I, I would, now I'm going to get Bob Rich to create a cartoon and take your idea and screw it into the old wall. Like, that's the way that we're going to do that. Um, but, 
But like when you get it, it, that doesn't sound like what Wall Street put her in the chair to do. I mean, you know, no, to, no, to, no, no. this is the woman who said on CNBC, under the circ- under the right circumstances, the Fed should be buying stocks. Under the right circumstances, the Fed should have negative interest rates. It's like all fairies, gumdrops, rainbows, bumblebees. It's all happy stuff. <laughs> but under the right circumstances, you know, over Jay Powell's dead body, nominal negative interest rates. And that, again, is where, because he will never not be a person who has financial market training. He knows that the Bank of England can impose negative interest rates, that everybody else can impose negative interest rates as long as the risk-free rate on planet Earth, i.e. U.S. risk-free rates, are positive to plug into everybody else's models so they don't blow up. Mm-hmm. And he well, knows that Jamie Dimon is more powerful than he is after the not QE episode. And you don't want to piss off the, you know, the, the commercial banks in the United States. And our money market fund industry is a little bit bigger than other major developed economies. So he, I think that Powell will hold the line on nominal negative interest rates. So your other route to take is to get money directly to the people. Well, I mean, this is where the conditional factoring of, your, of the outlook really does matter. Like if I get my 1.819 on the 10-year yield, that's a big nominal lift in, in bond yields. And by the way, as you know, particularly in the junk bond bubble, uh, it's not about the actual interest rate, it's about the spread risk on those rates. And yep. so all I have to do is be right directionally on interest rates and then whammo, slap 500 over uh, as opposed to where they're going to fall to right now. And that's, that's it. I mean, that's about as asymmetric a trade as you can get. Right. I mean, so what do they do about that? I mean, if you have, a, a, like, will, will Janet Yellen oversee and will Powell be able to do it, given what you said about Toomey's most recent um, legislation, will he be able to do junk bond bailout part two? And there's a lot more junk bonds, uh, as you know, to, uh, to do part two on. If, if they were There's only $1.4 trillion, Keith, calm down. And there's only $3 trillion of triple B bonds. And he saved them last time. Wait, he's not allowed to get out the same exact playbook. He's not allowed to say we're going to grandfather in every triple B that's downgraded. Right. And by the way, $3 trillion of debt later, because that's what the black swan of 2020 created on the non-financial debt side in the United States. So the, the question is a, a huge, I don't know. Can they come in and say, okay, we've never bought stocks before. We're going to buy stocks. And that's necessarily going to bail out the credit market. Eh. I don't think so because the credit markets transmit to the stock market, not the other way around. Exactly. Right? We've had we've had the VIX at an elevated level for all of 2020. It is stubbornly north of 20. It sniffs out danger, but the move index, the sister index for the bond market is at its absolute lows. And as long as it stays there, it doesn't matter what the VIX is saying. But if the if credit risk, if, if bond market risk really starts to move up, then it transmits to the stock market. It's not the other way around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's impor- a very important point, and it's uh, it's one hundred percent true. So uh, that's what I'm trying to envision, like what this world looks like. You know, so the alternative to that, Janet's going to be there. Let's just say that we get there, or the shit's hitting the fan. It's back to quad four. Everybody that watches Hedge Eye TV or subscribes knows what quad four is. It's bad. Um, so we're in that, and this time we're not allowed to buy the junk bonds because Janet's going to say, well, we should wire money directly to the people without jobs or with low income that have to pay with a new uh, have to pay for a new three percent inflation rate. Isn't that the way it's going to go? Well, again, uh, if it comes down to boldly bailing out Wall Street or boldly bailing out Main Street, I think I can tell you the direction that Jenny Ellen will go, even though, again, she is like a reporter in Afghanistan. She's embedded in right. Wall Street. Now. So, again, there is this great unknown also because she understands that trickle down economics is bunk, but trickle down Wall Street melting down, leading to higher layoffs. That's real. Okay, so that so, so that last part on because you know, the, are we going to control print jobs? Like, are we going to eliminate layoffs with literally printing jobs the way that the MMT crowd would like us uh, to try? Well, then the MMT crowd should stop talking about universal basic income and talk about infrastructure spending and job reskilling. If you want to control print a real job, if you want to control print somebody who lives on the dole, who has no economic pr- productivity capacity going forward, pay them to not work. And that's what's so disappointing to me, Keith. I'm not making a political statement, but if you want it to go big right out of the gate, because Obama got what? Obamacare. If, if you want to go big out of the gate and leave an economic legacy, then come out of the gate with infrastructure spending first. Mm-hmm. Don't say we'll get to that. We're going to do that next. First, we're going to give $1,400 to everybody so that all these day traders in the basement can be even more obnoxious on Reddit. Woo! 
America wins. No, it's not the way to have done it. it you, you come out of the gate saying, we're going to put people, we're going to forcibly put people back to work in America. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be a president in, in the spirit of FDR, and we're going to do public private partnerships. And it's, it's not going to be runaway bureaucratic government spending. We're actually going to do something tangible for the economy, or we're going to Stephanie Kelton and throw money at people. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's as absurd as it sounds. I mean, it's, it sounds like the absurdity is the more likely outcome. I mean, you don't have, look at the slide 76. I mean, we can teach people how to fish or we can give them the fish. I mean, it sounds like MMT wants to just wholeheartedly give them the fish and there's a 10 million uh, gap in that employment number to fill. And if you're mining the gap and the economy starts to slow, it's not only gonna not fill, it's gonna start going the wrong way again. So they're just gonna, I, but, I, am, is that wrong? As wrong as you, you think it is? I mean, I'm, by the way, I'm not a, a fan of socialism or, or, or control print jobs, but isn't it more likely that they do that than listen to people like us? Well, so, I mean, look, I, I'm not ignorant to MMT. Right now, my Twitter feed is just blown up, and I've got a bunch of MMT people <laughs> lecturing me on the foundations of MMT, and Danielle has a fundamental misunderstanding. But the first step is to make <laughs> sure people are okay and, you know, that they're not in poverty and make sure that that they're 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 covering their bills. Unfortunately, they do it in a blanket way that ends up putting money into the hands of people who don't need it. That is the fatal flaw of universal basic income. So you're trying to normalize and 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 steady the economy, steady the workforce, and then you're going to help people get back up on their feet and reskill and do the infrastructure spending and help them get to a new existence. But that's not the way American politics works. They're already talking about midterm elections. Mm -hmm. And the ink is barely dry on the presidential election. So come on. Well, I mean, Rickards made this point to me in a conversation recently that he said, hey, look, you know, that's actually the point is that they're going to have the runway to do whatever they want. MMT, combine the weaponry of both Treasury and Fed, control print, whatever you want. And then there's gonna be a result. And we're gonna see if America votes in the midterms for that kind of basically socialism. What is it that, what is it about um, the MMT that you allegedly don't understand, by the way? I think it's pretty straightforward. Well, MMT, especially the way Andrew Yang articulates it, which is very nicely, is is that in the end that people are working because people have been given the, the wiggle room that they need, the breathing space that they need to reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. but we live inside of election cycles. It's just a fact of life. Right. And so politicians are never given, I mean, if we had term limits, this would all be different. Look, look who has the term limit and is self-imposed term limit, Pat Toomey. Mm -hmm. He knew he was going to make all these enemies by doing what he was doing, and he didn't care because he knew that come 2022, as he committed to do, he was going to step down and live his term limit commitment. If we had term limits, Keith, and I'm not trying to be on some political soapbox, but you would actually have to get into office and do something meaningful as opposed to getting into office and putting out a bigger Band-Aid that yeah. doesn't do anything for productivity over the long term, and American productivity has suffered. Yeah, and, and, and kudos to Pat Toomey for that, for doing that. I mean, that's, by the way, he's probably one of the 1% of people in, in, uh, in Congress that actually knows what the high yield OIS spread actually is. Uh, but, you know, not, notwithstanding his knowledge, his market knowledge, and, you know, he's, he's, he's not like some raging socialist either. I mean, free market capitalism is something that I think he believes in. I, I, I wonder, though, like when, once we get to the point, if it matters. I mean, it really, to me, it looks like we're on that path. They're going to do it. Janet getting her job ensures it. There's, there's nothing in the way of that, I don't think. I mean, I've asked Kelton, by the way, to do, and, and if she'd like to do, uh, three-way with me and you, uh, I'd happily do it. And by the way, uh, she ignored me with records. <laughs> Somebody would take that out of context. I just can't even go there. Anyway, continue. No, no, of course not. Like, so I asked her, asked her to do it with records, and she's just crickets. Like, she doesn't want to have this kind of a discussion. Like, you know, it was one thing to become famous. The book's very good in articulate. And again, I don't think it's a very good idea. I think that it's very well explained. Presented. And, and, and it doesn't, it's not, we're not missing anything. I think that they're basically, you know, her point is, hey, you don't understand that the government's not like a household. I'm like, no shit, it's not like a household. We've been printing money and bailing out markets since I've been alive, you know, like, or at least as a professional. You know, I think we all know this, but there's, I, I, what's going to stop it from happening? I, I once watched a 30-minute interview of Stephanie on, 
on Bloomberg. And I listened to the very, very end. And in the very, very end, if you do get inflation, you just use the MMT lever. You just raise income tax rates in order to control for inflation. In the Congress of the United States of America, you just go, <laughs> let's raise income tax rates. I mean, hell, it took us eight months to do a $908 billion relief plan that almost had people evicted within days. So we're talking, and, that's, and, and that was not a misnomer. That was relief. That was make sure people don't get kicked out in the middle of the winter and become homeless. And it took us eight months to do that. And we're going to just flip a switch and raise in income tax rates? Raise right. income tax rates and or raise interest rates. Okay. No, no, like, no, no, no. The lever for MMT is not interest rates. It is income tax rates. That is how you control for future inflation. Hey, th this is their construct, not mine. No, I mean, you could absolutely end whatever inflation, cyclical inflation you have if, if the Federal Reserve were to raise interest rates after lunch today. Uh, you and, want to and try that experiment? Go for it. Anna Yellen has already brought up the taxes discussion. It's already in, it's already part of the discussion. They're already trying to decide what wealthy is defined as. Is it more than 400000 for the household? Is it less? It, is, it, is it going to depend on where they live? But, but see, these discussions are already being had about soaking the rich. But we know what happens when the rich get soaked. In many cases, they, they do move. Uh, this, is, this is straightforward math. I mean, when it comes to running a business, I think uh, you and I know that because we do. Uh, many of these people, of course, never have and never will. Uh, hence their academic uh, standing and their, their, their uh, government jobs that they so love. Um, all right, so um, I guess the last question on this before I go to, to questions here, um, why is it that on this whole inequality you know, gap uh, that, that Powell has been able to just talk of nothingness or no accountability on any of it so far? And, and why, why is it such a bee's nest for you still on Twitter? Well, you know, Keith, there are a lot of theories about it. And, um, and by the way, over the past four decades, there have been a lot of theories about it. Yeah. I, uh, I paraphrase. And, and that's the problem. You know, there was a good Bloomberg column that came out uh, a, a month ago or so that basically said, you know, the Fed cannot correct, the Fed cannot help ameliorate inequality. Well, that's true. It was like an entire half of a column. But the other half of the column that did not precede the column was that the Fed can greatly exacerbate the inequality divide. If they try and close the inequality divide by, oh, I don't know, let's say normalizing interest rates so that savers don't get screwed, retirees, that blows up all three <laughs> and it trickles down to job losses. So there's no elegant answer to, to narrowing the inequality divide and they clearly cannot admit to they're creating it. But you know, I'll step back since his Powell's public records are that over the past four decades when, by the way, interest rates have been falling and the Fed funds rate has been falling, but there was the predecessor to Alan Greenspan. There was the degradation of U.S. public schooling that set the stage for the inequality divide to get exacerbated and widened by Fed policy. So it was not initially created by Fed policy, but the bulk of the widening in U.S. history, in modern U.S. history, has is at the door of the Eccles building in Washington, D.C., period end. 100% agree with you on that. I mean, uh, guys, show slide 90. It's one of my favorite charts to show the gap uh, in a simple way, labor against capital. Um, so the labor line, as Danielle would uh, be able to, to tell you, is the blue line that went straight down to a generational low. Um, you know, this is where a lot of political outcomes may have gone squirrely relative to people's expectation, but the black line is corporates getting paid. So if you want to get corporates paid, you know, you don't pay labor and you reduce the cost of capital and you, you know, obviously... You, you raise the availability of that capital to infinity and beyond. So now it's going the wrong way. And what we've said so far, Danielle, I think we agree on this for sure, is that the blue line, you know, there's a, you know, Yellen's mandate is to get the blue line to keep going up. And there's really no way to get the black line to go down unless, uh, well, there's no way for the black line not to go down in the face of a cyclical slowdown anyway, um, I guess. And their answer is we're going to have a new black line, which is, isn't corporate profits, uh, for because you know, that's what you would used to employ more people, um, it's the government. And that's it. You know, you're gonna just, that's going to replace the job creation by, by you know, the private sector because as soon as we raise their income taxes, they're going to be able to employ less people. Um, you know, that, that, that's where we're at. Look, what we're headed towards here is 
because I, I listened to a politician a few days ago kind of try and get their way, dance their way around, 10 minutes into an interview talking about saving the small business sector. Some you know brave anchor said, well, don't you think raising the minimum wage to $15 would be kind of a nail in the coffin? Oh, no, no, no. They understand that people need to be paid more. And you know, <laughs> the anchor was like, but the small businesses are going out of business. Oh, but they understand it. So what we're going to end up with is a decimated small business sector. You're going to end up with right. a lot of the biggest corporations, big box retailers paying that minimum wage, but their cost structure will be able to afford it because they'll have more pricing power because small businesses will be, have been put out of business. It's just like the Amazon effect, but writ large across most of corporate America. Mm. So they'll pay a little bit more, but they'll be more automated. They have more money to put into IT. And so you're going to have more sclerosis and permanent unemployment that to your point is going to have to be offset by permanent government spending. Yeah, 80% of incremental employment is in the small business, small to medium-sized business community uh, when you're when you're in the, that part of the cycle. So it's like, again, these are known knowns. I think people just talk and they talk and they talk. And it's easier to have a story from uh, that guy Mosler, who, um, who Kelton, he's a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, I'm not going to actually use the word, it would be inappropriate, even from you and I, uh, to call him what I'd call him right now. But, you know, he, he, he played a game with his kids. And, and to get them to do chores, he created a currency with his business cards. And they, then all of a sudden the behavior changed. I mean, it's like, is this really what you guys like? Is this really what you believe? Or have e any of you, Mosler, Stephanie, et cetera, started a business, you know, run at a loss, run into any kind of a cyclical downturn, fired people, hired people? I mean, come on. This is, this is what's going to happen in the midterm elections, I assume, if they're just going to be able to academically uh, and theoretically create, you know, houses of cards. And again, if this is going to be in every nine months, we have to wait, wait, wait. We can't talk about the adult talk. We're going to have to put another Band-Aid on this. Oh, you no, know, we're, we're going to have to extend forbearance. We're going to have to extend foreclosure moratorium. We're going to have to extend eviction moratorium. We're going to have to extend everything so that in the history of the United States, we never have the onset of a household credit cycle ever. I mean, that is that is some strange socialist structure. <laughs> it's Europe. Uh, parts of Europe, at least. Um, all right, let's get some uh, questions because I think you and I could uh, go on and on about that. It's not funny. It's actually really sad, a lot of it. Um, uh, We're the not working in Europe after this chat, by the way. So <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the first question was about, uh, about Kelton and MMT. We already you know, beat that bag for a little bit. Uh, we'll come back to it. Don't worry. But uh, second one, uh, <laughs> funny question. Avery from California. Uh, is there a single redeeming quality about Powell? Yes, that he does not want to impose nominal negative interest rates. So that is, and I think at heart, he is a good person, but he saw the whites of the eyes of the credit market and he understands that systemic risk cannot be quantified and he doesn't want to figure it out on his watch. He just doesn't. He doesn't want to be the person who insisted on normalizing monetary policy and blew up the world. It, it doesn't look good on a resume, even if he's you know, a member of the Chevy Chase Country Club and he can go off and be retired because he's worth $150 million. It still does not look good in terms of legacy build. That's a, I mean, to me, that's, I've, I've seen him uh, like just, you know, behaving, you know, at restaurants and stuff, just, He's just a lawyer. Like he's just a guy, and you know, he's not like he's not the ideologue that uh, Yellen and Bernanke are. I mean, this is not. It's not that guy. Just a guy. He was always focused on. He was always focused on shrinking the balance sheet. He always understood that it was a, a can of worms to open for the Fed to have a bigger footprint than it should have. He always got that. He always understood that markets should be determinants of market prices, not monetary policy. That's at a fundamental level that that's why I'm not convinced that if he's reappointed come February of 2022, that he'll I'm not convinced he wants the job. <laughs> I don't Why would he? I mean, guys, slide 54. We put him in the middle of uh, of this uh, threesome uh, with CeCe Rouse and uh, Yellen. Just the man in the middle. And then he's going to I think he'd just be gone. That'd be it. I mean, why? Why would a why would a a guy, just a guy, just a lawyer who's worth a hundred million bucks want to deal with this going forward. He's getting old and he doesn't have an ideology. You know, it's not even, not even his party anymore anyway. <laughs> I just think it's over. He, he's a pragmatist. <laughs> yeah. No, a pragmatist would uh, exit stage left. So just a little advice from me there, uh, PE pal. 
uh, go back to PE and get paid another $100 million. That's going to be great. You know, there's some great, great, great opportunities in private equity right now. Uh, here's one. Here's a question from Jim in New Jersey. Um, Danielle, let's just uh, take Hedgeye's projections and assume that they're correct on, on greater than 3% inflation. Do you think there's a chance that the Fed would do at least one rate hike on that? Well, it's a process, right? They have to fully taper before you're really right. in rate hike realm. I mean, they, they can introduce rate hikes, but... I mean, if, if 3% was to persist, again, there would be bigger fish to fry. I mean, rather than rate hikes, there just would be. I mean, the whole thing broke uh, with even an attempt at quantitative tightening and the slowest normalization in, in history, you know, just 25 basis points every quarter. I mean, look, everybody wants for this inflation narrative to come to pass, everybody, and everybody wants for it to stick. And, and I, I get that. I really, really get that. But you cannot close an output gap in five minutes. Mm -mm, no. I mean, it it's an interesting thing, and I've had to come to terms with this morally just because you have to state the difference. I mean, selfishly, capitalistically, I am long of inflation. I have been since last June and made a shitload of money doing it, and I'm still long of it. You know, you I want to be long commodity inflation. So, but the but again, people have to pay for it. Would break the system. Real inflation would break the back of the system. Well, real inflation, let's just call it what it is, though. I mean, of the biggest line items in the, and again, if you look at the, the, the buckets or household incomes that really matter, i.e. no income or low income or even middle income, I, I, I will never call people part of a class. I think that's bullshit, too. Um, my dad was a firefighter, and, and I didn't ever think I was lesser of a class. Um, but you know, we had a certain amount of income. And a certain amount of income, if you put the buckets, you take shelter, food, and medical costs. You know, forget education, which you shouldn't. But all those start. things on a year-over-year -year basis are going through the freaking roof. I mean, this is not even a remote debate at this point. Now, t I'm, I'm long that inflation, but the people are going to eat it. I love that there's this, this discourse about rents falling in San Francisco and New York, and I'm like... <laughs> That doesn't mean that people can afford them. They're falling from the sky, for God's sake. And, and, and the cost of housing, if you think about this exodus to the exurbs, that's made housing more expensive for people who had to flee the cities to get affordable housing in the first place. This is salt in the wound for so many lower and middle income Americans who have, have years ago accepted long commutes into the city, but now the city's come to them and their apartment rent's gone up. So it's like gentrification, but gentrification via the suburbs and the exur exurbs. And you're right, when you add up those three basic line items, in many cases, there's nothing left. Yeah, it's a, and that was pre the price of corn, which is a pretty relevant uh, food in the food complex or in the egg complex. It, went, it just went up 30% in the last month. I mean, it's not, it, these are, so again, this cyclical inflation hurts the most amount of people at the m most inopportune time. That's just like anything in risk. It's like anything in fractal space. It happens slowly. It happens all at once. So again, that's why I, I think these things are going to be you know, highly inflationary in terms of how they look. People aren't going to sit there and say, hey, look, you know, let's dial back that pizza because of the base effects. No, they're going to say, wow, it's, it's expensive to, to have a family right now. But why is it expensive, Keith? I mean, if you think about, if you think about the, the economic forecasts that are saying China is going to surpass the United States as the largest economy. Now it's going to be three years earlier than it originally been expected. But think about what China's accomplishing right now. Yeah. They're food shy. So they need to import this food, which is causing inflation in America, which is making sure that our economy falls further behind. And by the way, they're shy of food. We're shy of chips. They're going to make sure that that supply chain stays totally disrupted to stick it to American corporations on the input cost side. So China right now is driving both, both trains, both. Well, they, had, they, they, uh, I think they thought that through. I mean, it is the 100th um, anniversary party of the Chinese here coming up in Q2. Again, when all the chickens come home to roost, they want to look as powerful as they ever have, and they will. You know, whether or not they are, it doesn't matter. It's the illusion of power, uh, and there's plenty right. of rate of change of power there. But the lobbyists here and the farmers will tell you that it's a symbiotic relationship. <laughs> well, how is it a symbiotic yeah. relationship just because they have a buyer if the costs for the people at home are going through the roof? Yeah. I mean, the loaf of we, we go through a loaf of bread every three days in this house. My kids eat a lot, but that loaf of bread's gone from two fifty nine to four eighty nine. Period. 
Yeah, you go to Kansas and you knock on a farmer's door and ask him to ask, ask him to tell you that he has a symbiotic relationship with the Chinese. I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on there. Uh, question here on <laughs> on the dollar. We, it's amazing we haven't uh, spent as much time on that. I think it's because our views on that are implied. Um, but the question is quite simply, like, what do you think the next leg down is for the dollar if you if you do think that the dollar is going lower? Well, I think right now we are at a what what we call technical resistance point uh, in the decline of the dollar. And mm -hmm. it remains to be seen, again, the magnitude, the scope, the post vaccine world, uh, how much debt the United States needs to keep on printing. If you want to know what the end game of the dollar is, let me go back to the discussion of China and the fact that if you want to make the American economy subsist and be subservient to the largesse of government spending, then you will eventually kiss the dollar goodbye. And I, God, I don't even want to go. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. But at the moment, I don't think that, that world leaders are kind enough to say, you know what, it's, it's going to lo lose reserve currency status and we're just going to give it to this digital hybrid instead. So. You mean, That's all I have to say about that, Keith. That's you mean, you mean uh, I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna use the word. Actually, I'm not. I'm not gonna go there because you're getting your your bees nest stirred for other reasons right now. Um, here's a I, I have a quite, I have an answer to this question. I want to see if we have the same answer. Uh, Jim in Naples, Danielle, what what happens next? Stagflation or deflation? So I think in the near term, again, a lot of China shut down and nobody's talking about it. So right now you have a dearth of deadhead containers headed back from the three big ports on the U.S. West Coast back to China, back to China. Mm -hmm. So we can't even get the product onshore in the United States as quickly as they can get it offshore in China. So we still have massive supply chain disruptions that are feeding through to input costs rising. Now, I, I will point this out. We wrote about this today at Quill Intelligence, shameless plug. The supply chain disruption in the Dallas Federal Reserve District is abating. So pay attention to that. Right now, there's a lot of stockpiling going on because, because manufacturers are so freaked out about input costs that they're like, I'm going to buy ahead. I'm going to stockpile it just in case the situation gets worse. But it could get worse given what's happening in China right now, period end, which is a margin squeeze because you're still not creating income growth, you're still not closing the output gap. So I would say stag precedes D and then you go and, and, and then and then the pricing power falls apart and you get to the quad four place. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting, um, you know, it depends on what your timeline is. But I mean, I, I basically call it the mother of all cyclical inflations that catches many people off sides, including humans that wouldn't know how markets move because they're going to eat it. Uh, and then you get a quick deflation, and then the Fed comes in and ref tries to reflate. So you get your ongoing stagflation. Remember, when the Fed wants to reflate, it can't. But that's a, that's going to be a major problem. I mean, <laughs> the, it, the problem. The Fed no longer wants to inflate, and, and the inflation takes off of its own volition. Again, that is crossing the Lacey Hunt land, uh, line in the sand. That is going to direct monetization, and that is an inflation that the Fed cannot control for. Well, this is, uh, here's another question. It's a follow-up question um, from, he's getting high votes, Jim, in New Jersey. Um, you know, the, the, the House... <laughs> The House of Cards, you know, point, and this is an interesting one, um, he's saying that it implies a collapse. Like, do you have a timeline for when this might occur, Danielle? By the way, do you think it means collapse? I, I think you, you should be able to answer that as well. Look, what we have seen the Fed accomplish in the space of 10 months is time compression. Yeah. We, we've seen a housing bubble pop up literally overnight. People forget that in late 2019, that MBA purchase applications had rolled over, that home prices were so high that people had stepped back from the market because affordability was had become such an issue. And then here comes Jay, and he's like, you know what, I'm gonna, or I'm gonna buy a third of the mortgage-backed securities market, or. And by the way, and I'm gonna enlist Fannie and Freddie to help me make sure that we get as much underwriting volume as feasibly possible. So I and we're going to have a pandemic, by the way, the black swan that the Fed needed to cause this once in a lifetime, once in 100 year exodus from major city centers. What I tell people is what is the one thing in 2021 that cannot be repeated? Excuse me. What's what's the one thing in 2020 that cannot be repeated in 2021? 
And that's the exodus. Mm -hmm. That's the exodus. Where are they going to go with home prices as high as they are? Is there a point at which you see saturation in housing because you've seen home prices rise as quickly as they have and because, because there simply are not enough people to put out there? And you have seen home builder optimism peak and roll over. Mm -hmm. So there's, you're starting to see. So if, if that's the house of cards you're talking about, the other one, I go back to Jeremy Grantham, who's like 80 something. So he's got way more experience than I do. And that's that when you get people who are as obnoxious and, and I'm, I'm talking about rude and dropping F-bombs and by the way, <laughs> boomer this and boomer that, they don't even know who they're talking to, by the way. They're just spouting off in, into, the, into the nowhere. When you get something that goes from 80 to 150 to 80 again, they're not pretending. We're not pretending that there's a, a, a bubble out there. We're not sitting there going, well, valuations are at the 99th percentile. If you look back to 1881 data by a Robert Schiller, who's at Yale. I mean, we're not even doing that anymore. That's like, forget valuations. They don't, they don't matter. But when people quit pretending and get to be as arrogant and rude as they are right now, I'm going to go with Grantham and say it's a matter of months, not years. And then you add to this the fastest home price appreciation that we've seen in years and years and years. This is not a good combination, people. <laughs> they can't be being rude to you. You know, first of all, you're no, not no, a, no, you're not a little, boomer. You're a Gen Xer. I'm not, no, I, no, I had somebody who doesn't even know what social media is. She's like, don't you do that Twitter thing? And I'm like, yes, occasionally. I <laughs> but she forwarded me an email yesterday and she was like, a friend of mine who's on Twitter sent this to me. And do you believe these people are dropping F-bombs in these chat rooms? And, 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 and she's a long-term veteran in private equity. And she's like, isn't there an SEC rule against pool? Are, are there institutional investors in here guiding these young people? And do they know that they're dropping F-bombs in public spaces? And I'm like, you need to go back to raising money for the pensions and you're doing a good job of what you're because there are going to be diversified with what you're what, what you're selling but you need to stay away from chat rooms just get away i love it when you do with the texas accent too that's just great are you that tweeter thing, <laughs> tweeter thing. you you get you keep on keeping on right you keep on tweeting on you keep on doing what you're doing keep doing your thing i i think you got it like you're it is like i said it's 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 sad actually that a voice like yours in a state like yours is kind of a minority voice right now in, in, in old wall media. That's for damn sure. Um, but I, th I think you're going to come back in vogue, you know, big time. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. <laughs> I, I don't think that that was a compliment. <laughs> I, or at least it was a left-handed one and I'm decidedly right-handed. So. No, you get, you get you're the, the, the trolling of it all. It's like you said, it's arrogant. Oh, it's coming right. after you. That's what I mean by that. It's like they're eventually going to they're going to thank you. They're going to thank you for American capitalism, for waving the flag, for telling the truth. Uh, that's what people love about you. You kiss your mother with that mouth. because That's one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, boy. Articulate. We can. Oh, boy. I mean, it's just uh, with that. Mother. I was in uh, the Bahamas uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, people were all really proud about their uh, holding title. It's like uh, that in Bermuda or two of the places where you can hold land title and you don't have to pay taxes and all that. So you, you meet a lot of like actually a lot of Texans down there. And um, and, uh, you know, I said something to a to a nice lady. We were talking about something and and <laughs> and I can't I can't tell you what she said she was going to do to the mouth. But I was like, what? And she was like laughing. She's like, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. And it's like, it's like, you know, she said, I'm going to kiss you in the mouth. And I said, what? Yeah, it's like. <laughs> Dodging going, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's like uh, my buddy who's, you know, obviously uh, married as well. He's like, we got to go. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we do too. Because <laughs> this is going like to a place where we could have a lot of fun. But anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Keith. Appreciate your time. Daniel DiMartino Booth, one and only. Thanks for joining us.